Welcome everyone to an exhibition of GPT-J, a 6 billion parameter transformer model from a collaboration between Ben Wang, or King of Lulz on GitHub, Arang Kamatsuzaki, and Eliezer AI. There is so much that we can do with just this one model that sometimes it may be confusing just what a transformer model is actually doing or what things like few shot learning even means. So for the very first example, we'll take a very high level approach through what's going on and then we'll run through a variety of examples that I think you'll find extremely impressive and rather shocking that it all runs from the same model. For this high level approach, I'll be obscuring away various bits of code just to make things more clear to understand the order of operations, but I will put links in the description for everything you could possibly need depending on how deep you want to go towards understanding how these models work, actually running the model, as well as a text-based version of the run-through of all of these examples. We'll start with the context of transformer models are quickly advancing the field of artificial intelligence. Now, neural networks do not work in string data, they work in array data. So the first step that we're gonna take here is to convert this into an array. And we do that with what's called a tokenizer. So we can come down here and we can say tokens is equal to tokenizer.encode. And again, the tokenizer has already been loaded here. Uh, and this will be the starting context. Then we can go ahead and just print out and display these tokens. And we can see here, this is the array representation of this string. The next step in our pipeline is going to be to pad this input vector. This is because the input layer to our neural network is of fixed size. In this case, that's 2048 or 2048 sequence length of tokens can be input into the network, but in this case we have much less than that. So what we do when that is the case is we pad the front of that vector. So for example, we can output padded tokens and we can see it starts with a bunch of zeros and then ends with uh, our actual vector. The next step is essentially to pass everything through the model. There are some parameters here. Uh, the first one you'd probably want to take a look at is the generative length, which is specifying how many tokens that you want the model to actually generate. Otherwise, we also have temperature top P and top K. These are all parameters that you can tune to adjust the variability in outputs, but for now we'll keep them as the defaults and we will get our actual output. We get various information from the output variable, but the actual output tokens that we're after can be found here. These are indeed all of our tokens, but they're in a slightly strange shape. This is just simply due to how they're generated. For now, we'll go ahead and store these into these, this output samples variable, and we can check the shape, which is a 1 by 128 by 1. What we really want to do is be able to reference these tokens in sequential form. And since this is a NumPy array, we can use some NumPy magic and boom, we have our actual sequence of tokens. Since this is an array of arrays, because it's a batch, even if it's of one, we can iterate and then detokenize the sequence. And what we get is that continued generative output. We can then shorten this a little bit, add some color, and we can see our full output here. In yellow, we've got the original input, and in cyan, that's the generated output. So feel free to pause the video and give that a read. It's pretty uh, exceptional. <laughs> I seriously doubt anybody would be able to tag this as being written by an AI, unless they already knew. So not only does this model appear to have a grasp on the English language and grammar and all that, it also appears to have a decent grasp on just the subject of deep learning, giving a pretty darn good summarization of what it is. Now, we can certainly quibble about how much of this might be memorization, but I invite you to, for now, hold those quibbles because we're really just getting started on the subject matter that this model knows and the things that it can produce. For example, one of the types of data that this model was trained on was GitHub in Stack Exchange, which of course includes programming. We can try to get the model to write a regular expression for us by adding a comment in the code that suggests that the thing that's going to come next is indeed a regular expression that will find the dollars. As we can see when the model finally finishes, it did indeed output the rest of the code for us and it produces what I think is mimicking Stack Exchange where someone is likely asking a question and then there's maybe an answer and some more information. We can then just copy the code part, paste it into an editor, run it, and we can see that it indeed did parse out the dollars. The string formatting included an extra dollar sign, so we could either fix that by either removing the dollars, you know, the backslash dollar sign from the regular expression or from the string that we printed at. Either way, it worked pretty well. One other thing to note is that since there are some degrees of variability, we can actually run this exact same input prompt again and get a different response. Again, in this case, let's just grab the regular expression, 
copy it over to the editor, print it out, and again, the different output from the model, but the same thing happened. It worked. It gave us a valid regular expression. Okay, so regular expressions with Python code works pretty well. Very cool, but there's still a whole lot more here. Let's try another programming task, OpenCV, using a very similar method. We'll import CV2, specify a file name, and then nothing else. We'll just slap in a comment that says, hey, we'd like to open the image and find the edges. Again, we get some output. It continues actually writing more code than we, we initially cared about, at least for now. Maybe you're interested in that the other code and doing those things next, but for now, we're just going to take the edge detection only. Copy and paste that into the editor. In this case, the code saved the output as an image rather than doing something like cv2.mshow, but that's fine. We can pull those up and we can see here's the edge photo and the original full color photo. It indeed did find the edges using canny edge detection. And again, all we did was just import cv2, specify a file name, and said, here's what we want to do. How do I do that? Okay. How about something with a few more lines of context and a few more lines required to complete the objective? In this case, we'll start with some common TensorFlow and Keras imports, and then we'll load in some data set that we have, and then again, we'll use a comment to suggest the following code should be a three-layer convnet with a 64 by 64 imagery with five classes. I tried to pick sizes and classes that are a little more rare, so something like 28 by 28 and 10 classes is going to be super common, for example. 64 by 64 might be common, I don't know. Five classes is pretty rare. I tried looking for image data sets with five classes, I couldn't really find many, so hopefully that's good. What we get in return is the entire code for a convolutional neural network, including training and testing. Again, we'll copy the code and run it, and sure enough, it's fully functional in training. It looks like it's ready for testing data too. What happens though if we change our mind and we actually want to have a two-layer convolutional neural network and seven classes? Again, I think seven classes is fairly rare. For the model to get this right, it would really need to understand where one might actually make a change, i.e. in the final dense layer, to account for some specific class count. In this case, we get a completely different output, including even the styling of how the network code is written and how the network is actually built. But again, we get completely valid code. It is indeed a two-layer convnet. This one even specifies the 64 by 64 shape. The previous code was also correct. It was arguably better. It was actually a bit more of a dynamic handling for the uh, input image shape than just hard coding the shape. But this is what we asked for too. Again, we can just copy and paste this into an editor, run it, and indeed it also works. This model is actually training and is a totally valid code to the spec that we asked for. While this is really cool, it's not just Python code that it can do. For example, we can open up with a HTML and body tag and then make a comment about an upcoming button that will return a function when clicked. GPDJ goes ahead and adds some paragraph text that says if you click the button, your browser will be taken over. Okie doke. Uh, no Skynet vibes or anything like that. And it indeed adds some code for a button, which does come with an on-click handler. GPDJ also ends up closing off the body and HTML tag, so this is actually a complete HTML file. So we can copy, paste, and view it for ourselves. Pretty uneventful, since the takeover function doesn't actually exist, but so far GPTJ has done everything we've asked of it, so how about we add another comment that says, here's a takeover function. It will send an alert that states the browser now belongs to us. On the first run, there's a bunch of stuff here. It looks like it's valid code in some way, but I'm not sure it's doing what we actually want it to, and I really want and expect something simpler. So we'll just run it again. And this looks much, much better. So copy and paste that again, refresh the page, and let's check it out. Beautiful, does exactly what we wanted. While these are extremely impressive examples, and we could keep going with programming, this model's not a programming model. It's really more like a general purpose language model that just so happens to be able to also write code alongside all of the other things it does. GPDJ was trained on a data set called the pile, and here you can see a tree map of the contents of that data set sorted by color, showing if the data is academic, style, from the internet, prose, dialogue, or something else entirely. 
Then, within those categories, we can see the actual source of the data. So, actually, Stack Exchange and GitHub, the source that contains programming information, they aren't even the majority of what this model has learned from. This model also has knowledge of things like medicine, law, mathematics, general conversations, and much more. Scrolling down a bit, we can see a table of how the dataset in this model was weighted and for how many epochs it was trained. A massive area of research is available just in coming up with balancing a dataset like they've done here and getting the results like they've done here. So what else can we do? We can ask generic questions like who invented calculus and just see what the response continues with from there. But we can also structure these prompts in such a way so as to encourage the model to follow our structure. So for example, we can use Q colon and A colon. In this case, where we ask about voltage for a standard US home outlet, I also limited the model's response to just be up to the next new line. But we can see that indeed the answer is correct. We can also let the model continue for longer. Our original question of when the US Revolution began is answered, and that date is probably in reference to the Revolutionary War's beginning. But then we can see that GPTJ went ahead and also just made up more Q's and A's. As they progress, I, they get a little stranger, I think, and less based in any sort of reality. Generally, the first answer that you get back is indeed a correct answer, but then it kind of gets weird. So I suspect Maggie's diners are in many places, and I don't think Hawaii has a hockey team either. Alaska doesn't, but I don't think Hawaii has a professional one either. And Utah's state name actually originates from an Apache Indian word. But still, the structure of question and answer it continues to be mimicked by the model. Like, it's, it's trying to stick with that structure for us. So continuing along, we can see that the Q&A structure happens again when our first answer is correct-ish. Uh, I hope no one is actually changing their oil every 3,000 miles, but <clears throat> big oil change would like you to believe that. Uh, I suppose if you wanted to drain every last drop of oil, it would take a, about an hour to get every last drop. And the final answer about not filling your gas after an oil change is a bit weird. I don't think I've ever heard that. I don't think that has any basis, so that's kind of curious to see. I, I think GPTJ made that up. The concept of the structured prompt can be quite interesting. For example, we can check out what happens when we mimic a sort of chat log between a human and a bot, and in effect, we're creating a chat bot from an otherwise just generative language model. We're starting off with whatever the human said, let's say. We leave a space for the bot's response, and we're just going to collect up to the new line. We get a reply and the bot just says hello back, but we can continue this chat log by asking what the bot is up to, prompting another response. This can go on for as long as we like and the discussion is completely contextualized as the entire previous discussion is passed through the model every single time, so the bot should stay relatively on topic. We can also remove the next line only bit and let the bot just generate more of the script for us, so no longer much of a chat bot, but also Interestingly, the bot decides to indeed close off the chat quite quickly since we did say we were done anyways, and taking a shorter section of the script before the goodbyes without any line limit spawns a different behavior, translations. We can check these and see that some are decent, but it's definitely not the best. I think we've, we've seen before that the further we let GPTJ walk on its own, the sillier it can get, and I think this is especially true as soon as the kind of structure goes away or gets changed by the model. We can adjust those parameters that we referenced earlier to try to get a handle on this if we want, but it is going to be very specific to exactly what you are trying to do. We can also be more specific ourselves, and we can actually ask the model to go ahead and perform a translation for us. And usually in these cases where we try to do directly a translation, it does do a much better job. Here, we've done a Spanish translation very successfully. We can also try something like German, and we can see that that indeed also worked. Again, being kind of a next-line prediction or translation, these tend to work quite well. But we can also let GPTJ do a few translations and just let it kind of pick what does it want to translate to next. And again, kind of as expected, it's randomly choosing its own translations, and uh, it, it does okay, but it also gets pretty quickly sidetracked. 
GPTJ, despite getting sidetracked, can generate long form responses quite well when the structure doesn't change or isn't suggested that it might change. So when you're asking new, unique questions or making new, unique translations, it's very difficult for the model to figure out what should come next. In, in Q&A, for example, it could be literally any question and answer. For translation, it could be any language to translate to. If you just want an article, this is totally doable and is also similar to the much larger code blocks that we saw earlier with like the neural network in TensorFlow slash Keras. I won't hang on this whole thing long enough for you to read it, but if you want, you can pause the video and give it a read. It's fairly well written. The arguments aren't really the best that I've ever seen, so it's kind of comical and whimsical to uh, argue for AI regulating humans because it can hang out in your closet and give you flowers on your birthday and control your thermostat. But regardless of whether or not the argument could sway you, it can make the argument in long-form text. Other interesting examples are lists, where here, for example, we list three similar-ish books, at least likely to be enjoyed by the same person, and we get a list of other similar books, though there are some repetitions here. It's about in line with what you would expect with this starting book list. We can even take this a step further and just start naming some stuff. So without even saying, you know, X list. So GPTJ understands that these are television shows and it picks a couple more that are similar to the ones that we've already listed. Not only does GPTJ understand multiple spoken languages and programming languages, it also understands the emoji language. This isn't a general intelligence, but the model is generally intelligent. It knows a lot about a lot of stuff, and I encourage you to play with this model if you're able to. And think about how you might use this model's abilities. In the end, it's just a generative model, but you've seen that with a tiny bit of logic added. It could be a chatbot or a question answerer. It can write code for you. It can recommend books and movies, and it can honestly do probably a ton of stuff that we don't even know about yet because so few people have had the opportunity to play with these gigantic large language models. So with that in mind, a huge thank you to everyone involved in making GPTJ a thing. I have spent way too much time just simply playing with this model and being absolutely blown away by what it can do. It, it's truly incredible. It, it has been very hard for me to make and close a video like this because I don't think I'll ever feel like I've even remotely done this model justice and showing you all of the things that it can do and still have that video be less than 10 hours. So hopefully this was enough to pique your interest and show you some of the many capabilities of GPTJ. If you can't run it locally, there's also a web-based prompt that you can also check out to just play with GPTJ. Obviously, you won't be able to directly add logic and stuff like that, but you can still tinker. In closing, I will share a paper someone from the GPTJ channel in the Ellie There AI Discord shared with me, and that's using a 7 billion parameter language model. So this one, GPTJ, is 6 billion, but 7 billion is not too far off. And what they've done is taken a large language model and then also trained an image captioning model, kept the language model frozen, and the inputs are encoded image data from the image captioning model, along with text that is structured like they would like, and essentially they're mixing few shot natural language with this encoded image data. And the results here are essentially few shot learned captioning styles, which is crazy. I think the fact that something like this is even remotely possible uh, should dispel anyone's thoughts that all these models do is memorize and compress. It's no doubt that there's a lot of memorization and compression that's going on, but there is something else going on. If you'd like to learn more about the goings-ons of neural networks at the most base components, there's a book you may have heard of once or twice on my channel called Neural Networks from Scratch. You can learn more at nnfs.io. That's all for now. Thanks for watching, and until next time.